This is part one of a two-part quick overview of plate tectonics. Normally we spend a couple of weeks really delving into um, the concepts and ideas and evidence of plate tectonics. But this year, because of the schedule, we don't have enough time to do that, so we're just going to go through it very quickly in just two days. Our first day here, we're delving into the first kind of history of plate tectonics, where it first started with, with continental drift. Um, before we do that, just go over what the plate tectonics theory is. So we're kind of starting with the end, and then we'll go back to the beginning. So the plate tectonics theory is that the Earth's surface, the lithosphere, is broken into pieces called plates. The plates float on the asthenosphere and move because of seafloor spreading. They either move into each other, creating convergent boundary, away from each other, creating a divergent boundary, or slide next to each other, creating a transform boundary. Now those underlined words that are in red are words that might be new to you. We will go over those in this quick in these quick couple of lessons. And you see a couple of pictures here. Basically it's showing you the different plates of lithosphere. Think of lithosphere kind of like the crust. Uh, North American plate, Pacific plate, Caribbean plate, Cocos plate. You see all these different plates here. You can also see them here and here. And then these boundaries that we're talking about that we'll go over later are the lines and you see the different arrows indicating whether it's a divergent boundary or a convergent boundary or a transform boundary. I says we'll go over all that a little bit later but we're starting with where this plate tectonics theory first really started and it first started with a guy named Alfred Wegener and you see him up here uh, dressed in his um, outfit for up in Greenland, where he did most of his work. So Alfred Wagner was a German meteorologist. I said he did most of his work in Greenland in the early 1900s. Well, during World War I, he was injured. He had a neck wound. And while he was laying in the hospital, he looked at a map of the world, and he noticed that the edges or the outlines of the continents fit together like pieces of a big jigsaw puzzle. And you see a little bit of that in this picture here with maybe North America and Africa, South America, it kind of fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. Or in this picture here, so the coastlines fit together like they're in a jigsaw puzzle. So he's laying there and he, you know, thinks they look like to fit together. And instead of just going, you know, huh, that's interesting. He decided that he was going to prove that they were together. He knew that he needed evidence to support this. And that's what he is gonna find. So as he researched and found five pieces of evidence to prove that they were together, he called the single giant supercontinent Pangaea, or Pangaea, Pan meaning all, Gaia meaning Earth. And his theory is called continental drift because he thought the continents drifted apart from Pangaea to where they are today. And we'll see that there is, you know, a little bit of an issue with this. But this is the first seed of the idea that led to plate tectonics. So as evidence, we're going to go through it really quickly because, again, we're just doing a quick summary. The first piece of evidence was this jigsaw puzzle fit of the coastlines of the continents. Okay, you look at especially South America and Africa, they really seem to fit nicely their coastlines. North America fits really nicely onto Africa. You might have Madagascar slide into Africa really nicely. So the, the, the continents look like they fit together. His next piece of evidence is one of the most important ones, and we'll actually delve into it more with the next slide but fossil evidence. So we'll come back to fossil evidence when we get to the next slide. His third piece of evidence were rock sequences. So he had rock sequences, and you see a, an example of a rock sequence down here. Basically, it's basalt on top of sandstone, on top of shale, on top of coal, on top of glacial till. So if you would dig a hole, you would find basalt at the top, sandstone underneath it, etc. So he looked at the five southern land masses, which are called Gondwana land or Gondwana, okay, Gondwana or Gondwana land, and he found this same rock sequence on all five of those southern land masses. So it made sense that these five southern land masses, you see them here, South America, Africa, India, Australia, Antarctica, it made sense that they all fit together because they had the same rocks that were spread over all of them. They might have had different amounts of these rocks, but they were the same rocks in the same order. So it made sense that they were all together when the rocks were laid down. 
Even more important than that is that he found rocks that seemed out of place where they are. For example, coal. He found coal on Antarctica. If you think about where coal forms, it forms in kind of marshes, tropical areas. We think of Antarctica as really, really cold, snow covered. You wouldn't have tropical ferns falling into swamps there. So that didn't make sense. Glacial till, so um, remains left by glaciers. Finding that in Africa, well, that doesn't make sense with what we think about Africa today. We think of Africa, uh, especially up kind of in mid-Africa here, it's a lot warmer than that. We don't have glaciers there. So that was very out of place with where they are now. Which leads to his idea that, well, Africa didn't always wasn't always where it was where it is now. Antarctica wasn't always where it is now. They drifted from different places. Antarctica used to be warmer, so it used to be closer to the equator where it had tropical ferns on it, and then it drifted south to where it is now. This idea of drift, he said. His fourth piece of evidence was that mountain ranges lined up between the continents. And you see a little bit of this picture here. You have the Appalachian Mountains is North America. They match with the Atlas Mountains in Africa, but they also extend up into Greenland and over into Europe. So we found that these were the same mountains, just split by the oceans. Okay, so the mountains were very similar. They fit together, just split by the oceans. So it made sense that the mountains were formed when those land masses were together. And then his fifth piece of evidence was that glacial striations ran from one continent to another. Glacial striations are just long scratches in the bedrock left by glaciers moving. So glaciers are these big pieces of ice, and frozen into the bottom of them are little rocks. As the glaciers move, those little rocks make long scratches on the continents. So what he found was these southern land masses, again, the Gondwana land masses, had these striations that lined up. By looking at them, you could tell that there was the central kind of mass of the glacier was right in this area here. And then the glacier spread out from that central mass. And you could tell that by the scratches. And then the glacial till remains that were left kind of where they ended. And he was, again, did most of his work in Greenland where there was lots of glaciers, so he really understood this, and he saw these glaciers were moving on to South America. They were moving on to India. They were moving on to Australia. Where now, if you look at a map today, to the east side of South America, it's an ocean. You couldn't have a glacier in the ocean and move on to South America. There had to be land there. Okay, there's an ocean south of Australia. You couldn't have had the glacier there and then move on to Australia. So it had to have been land there. So he concluded that they all had to be together there. So he had these five pieces of us. I said the fossil one was one of the most important ones. And we'll see that more on the next slide. So here is uh, some pictures that really show this fossil evidence. So with the fossils, there's two kind of key points. First off, he found that the fossils lined up across the land masses. So if you look at just some of these, these are four different fossils, and you're finding them in different tracks across these Gondwana land masses again, where these tracks line up of where they found the fossils. And you look at a fossil like this one, Sinonathus, this big reptile, three meter long reptile, it could not swim across the ocean from South America to Africa. South America and Africa must have been together in the past, and the range of this reptile was right in here because of its climate area and vegetation, everything like that. And then the continents drifted apart with the fossils stuck where they were. Same thing for Lystrosaurus and these other fossils too. Um, this one here was really important, Glossopteris. It's a tropical fern. And he found this fossil on all five of the southern land masses, all the Gondwana land masses again. So again, it was significant in that it tied all five of them together. So again, they must have been together in the past. And what was also very significant 
was that it was a tropical fern. And where did we find it? Well, we found it in Antarctica. How would you have a tropical fern in Antarctica? Well, you'd have it in Antarctica because Antarctica used to be closer to the equator where it was warm and could have a tropical fern on it, and then it drifted south to where it is now. So the fossil evidence was really a big one. So here, kind of the last page for this um, short introduction, we see what Pangaea looked like. So you see all the different land masses together as they were as part of Pangaea. And of course, they did move around, like I said, to change the climate, to change where fossils um, were or the different rock sequences were. So it was a really good idea. Um, unfortunately, it really wasn't believed by scientists in the day. Um, Wagner was pretty much ridiculed for having this theory put out there. He went back to Greenland um, with most people not believing him, at least in uh, in the in the northern hemisphere. In the southern land masses, they, they, there were some people that did believe him because they saw all this evidence in Gondwana. But he was a German, he was a meteorologist. They didn't really want to believe him. His big, the big reason for not believing him, though, and a, and a legitimate reason for not believing him, was that he did not have a good mechanism. What that means is he didn't have a good reason or a good understanding of what would cause these continents to move through the oceans, to kind of plow through the oceans. He didn't know what caused these continents to move, and without that mechanism, it's very hard to get people to believe in this theory. So very good evidence, very good theory, but like I said, without that mechanism, really people didn't um, believe him for the most part. It's going to take some other developments, which we'll learn in the next video, um, to get people to understand uh, what he was saying and then really start to kind of believe that maybe Pangaea did exist. And we'll save that all for the next one.